what we were are requesting states to do in those countries is um, something different than what we are requiring states to uh, to do in countries which are in a much more desperate uh, 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 situation. Uh, what I want to say is that the human right, water, and sanitation is relevant uh, to 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 all countries, and that the principle of progressive realization is also relevant to all countries. And uh, the principle of progressive realization also means that there is a prohibition of retrogressive measures. There is a prohibition to take steps backwards. What do I mean? I mean that if I install um, a, a, a water pump today, um, if I fail to maintain it, it means that eventually it will break down and that this this issue this problem might be seen as a retrogressive measure and even as a violation of the right to water and sanitation. I also uh, mean that in developed countries, uh, if not enough resources are being devoted to operation and maintenance, and if we witness the breaking down of system, systems, this might also be a retrogressive measure. I'm not saying that a priori, it is a violation of the right to water and sanitation. It can maybe be justified by authorities due to lack of resources, for example. But in principle, it is. Uh, it can be seen, it should be seen as a violation of these uh, human rights. It's up then to uh, authorities to justify these retrogressive steps. And again, as I was saying, in a situation of crisis or in a situation of public emergency, national uh, natural disasters, uh, this can, uh, uh, can probably be be justified. Uh, what do the rights to water and sanitation also mean in very concrete terms for authorities? It means that a first step, uh, an obligation of immediate realization is the obligation to do national planning, to adopt a national plan, and there is no excuse uh, not to develop a plan of action and strategies for implementing these, uh, these rights. And the planning, as I've said in one of my reports to the UN, is a starting point. With no planning, implementation will be impossible. And I know, we all know, that a lot depends on political, uh, that, uh, on political, uh, on political will. Uh, if states make it a priority, they can achieve a lot. I've, san I've seen this in uh, some of the countries that I have uh, 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 visited in my role as UN Special Rapporteur. Uh, what would I say are success factors for planning? I would say a sound legal framework based on the human rights to water and sanitation, uh, based in, in particular, based on human rights in general, a sound legal system that ensures access to justice, a strong, uh, um, strong institutional framework, strong institutions, clear assignation of and designation of responsibilities, uh, avoiding overlaps, but also avoiding gaps, uh, ensuring adequate financing, ensuring participation, ensuring transparency, and also having the principle of non-discrimination, the reduction of inequalities, as a center element of any planning. Planning which is just aimed at ensuring overall progress, overall improvements, is not sustainable and is not in conformity with human rights. Human rights call on us to target the most marginalized, the poorest, the people who are most left behind because they belong to an indigenous minority, because they are homeless, because they live in a slum, because they have a different color, that they speak a different language, uh, because they have a disability, because they are, um, because we are talking about women or elderly people or even children. So, um, or people belonging to a lower caste. So, progress will not trickle down. Progress will not, by, by, by a miracle, at, uh, reach these people. And this is what I've systematically seen on my country missions. And this is also what international reports say. And this is one, as you know, one of the greatest criticism that has been uh, directed to the current Millennium Development Goals. Uh, that inequalities are the biggest blind spot of the MDGs. So it is crucial to target these people. Uh, I know that, uh, and you know, that much of what I said is common sense, but I think that human rights promote, uh, the human rights framework helps to promote planning. And how? Because it provides a framework for prioritization. 
as I was saying, prioritize the unserved, prioritize basic services besides moving up and providing better access. Focus on those who are discriminated against. It also provides a framework for ambitious but realistic planned, planning, Sorry, not just based on trends, but going to the maximum of their availability. It ensures sustainability, and as I was saying, in order to avoid retrogressive measures, which might be considered as violations of the rights. Uh, and the issue of sustainability also calls on the need to address the underlying structural causes of lack of access. And obviously, human rights emphasize accountability. What does this mean for service provision? It means that there is a need for regulation, and I've said this in, one, in my second report to the Human Rights Council. Regardless of the form of service provision, whether private or public, uh, and here, as a parenthesis, I would like to say that private sector participation is not prohibited by human rights law. I would even say human rights law are agnostic as to the form of service provision. What human rights determine is that there is an obligation to protect, no matter what the form of service provision, and the obligation to protect rests with the state and remains with the state even when the state delegates service provision. The state can never e exempt itself from its human rights obligations by involving non-state actors in service provision. So irresponsible of the responsibilities of the latter, of the service provider, the state remains the primary duty bearer for the realization of human rights in general and the rights to water and sanitation in particular. The obligations in cases of delegating service provision uh, exist, but they also exist in cases of informal service provision. So the state needs to set clear standards, for example, on tariffs, on affordability, on water quality. The state has to monitor service providers, formal, informal. Um, the state has to build up the regulatory capacity in the state, uh, in the country. It has to enforce standards. It has to establish complaint mechanisms. It has to put in place accountability mechanisms. And at the same time, there is the obligation to fulfill. The state has to create an enabling environment, look at the broader aspects of planning in a comprehensive way, uh, uh, remains totally uh, uh, relevant. It cannot be delegated to service providers. States, for example, must put in place social policies, for example, subsidies to ensure affordability. This must come from the state, not from service providers. And obviously, the state has to ensure that planning covers all areas of the country, that it does not leave behind out uh, slums, for example, rural areas, impoverished uh, areas. This is what the full realization of human rights mean. So these, uh, uh, again, are just some broad ideas of how the human right to water and sanitation can influence planning and can and, can and should influence regulation. Um, just as a last note, uh, I don't want to be longer. Um, I am in the process because I see the importance of moving from principles to practice, from rights to reality, I am working on a handbook or a, a, a series of modules target, targeting different issues as uh, lawmaking, uh, regulation, um, uh, the issue of disconnections, planning, etc. Uh, and how to integrate the human rights to water and sanitation in all these aspects. So I am um, uh, aiming at uh, preparing these tools uh, in the framework of uh, in the time frame of the next two years, and as I was saying, they aim at being tailored to the needs of people working in the in the sector. I am thrilled by the enthusiasm with which this project has been uh, uh, received by many practitioners, namely by uh, IWA, and I'm looking very much forward to continuing the collaboration uh, with the IWA, namely, and others on this and other projects. It has been a pleasure to address you, and I hope to have further chances to interact with you uh, in the future. Um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I wish you uh, uh, the continuation of very fruitful uh, deliberations. Thank you.